Good evening, everyone. I'm Jordan Carter, Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening's virtual conversation with Miranda July. This dialogue anticipates the upcoming exhibition titled Ray Johnson Care Of, co-curated by Caitlin Haskell and myself, opening November 26 here at the Art Institute. The accompanying catalog designed by Irma Boom will soon be in a bookstore near you and is available now for pre-order on the Art Institute's website. We're thrilled to have you all joining us virtually. And while we wish that we could welcome you here in person, we hope that this digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. We'll begin with a little housekeeping. This program will be shared in presentation mode. So we have turned off video and microphones for attendees. For optimal, for optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under view options in the top right corner of your screen. We encourage you to share your questions throughout the presentation via the chat function. Some of these questions will be addressed during a q and I will be moderating at the end of the conversation. Closed captions are available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. Now, a few words about Miranda. Miranda July is a filmmaker, artist, and writer. Her videos, performances, and web-based projects have been presented at the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, and in two Whitney Biennials. July wrote, directed, and starred in the 2005 film, Me and You and Everyone We Know, which won a special jury prize at the Sundance Film Festival and four prizes at the Cannes Film Festival. And July's latest feature film, Cajillionaire, was released in fall 2020. And her newest book, Miranda July, was also released in 2020 and is a complete retrospective of all of her work to date. This evening, Miranda July is joined by Caitlin Haskell, Gary C. and Francis Comer Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art for a conversation on the past, present, and future of male art as a personal, social, and institutional mode of engagement. July will discuss her own unique approach to correspondence as artistic practice while looking at the work of Ray Johnson, an artist associated with the emergence, with the emergence of pop art, fluxus, and conceptual art, and often referred to as the quote, grandfather of male art. We find this evening's program particularly timely and resonant. Indeed, at a time when isolation is a survival strategy, and the United States Postal Service has been on our minds more than ever, the profoundly elusive artist Ray Johnson reemerges with much to offer the current moment. On the one hand, Johnson was among the first to perceive the potential of the Postal Service to function as an artistic medium and even as a broadcast technology. And on the other hand, his mill art was incredibly intimate and highly ephemeral. As the founder of the New York Correspondent School, or NYCS for short, Ray Johnson cultivated an international network of correspondents through the mail who became a close personal community despite being geographically dispersed. Our exhibition and catalog, Ray Johnson Care Of, unpacks the many ways in which he orchestrated these exchanges and considers how his diverse practices, including collage, design, letter writing, performance, artist books, and self-publishing, might come into clearer focus through the distinct paper trails his collaborators amassed and preserved. Although the objects in the exhibition and catalog bear many to and from addresses and recipient and requests to please send to, it is no exaggeration to say that Ray Johnson comes to the Art Institute care of William S. or Bill Wilson, whom Johnson designated as the quote, official archivist of the New York Correspondence School. This evening, we are pleased to be sharing, um, sharing with you works from the William S. Wilson collection of Ray Johnson, which was acquired by the Art Institute in 2018 and will make its first appearance in the museum's galleries in Ray Johnson care of this November. Over the course of a nearly 60 year friendship with Johnson, Wilson assembled and singularly preserved arguably the largest and most significant collection of Johnson's works of the 1950s and 60s. His collection included such iconic works as Elvis Presley number no. one, Oedipus, and Elvis Presley number no. two, included in the on-screen image carousel. These works continue to be considered early cornerstones of the pop art movement. After Johnson passed away in 1995, Wilson began the project of sorting through and catalog cataloging his archive, as well as the archive of the NYCS. Ultimately, the vehicle he chose for holding his collection of mail art was the three ring binder, Working with several assistants, Wilson ultimately compiled a series of 177 chrono chronologically sorted binders that together create a material history of Ray Johnson's life and works. You'll be seeing many of Wilson's binders this evening. These binders function as a sort of index of exchange and care and operate as a sort of contextual leitmotif throughout the catalog and exhibition. Wilson was fond of quoting Johnson's statement, quote, 
I wait not for time to finish my work, but for time to indicate something one would not have expect, expected to occur. Now transferred to the care of the Art Institute, Wilson's archive is now institutionally recognized as such, a uniquely self-styled register of an artist who resisted categorization and chronology. Johnson's work holds the promise of unexpected parallels to artists working today, such as Miranda July, who similarly strive to create community through their works and operate within and outside the usual contours of the art world. It is these unexpected, quote, coincidences and correspondences, as, Wilson's one, as Wilson once called them, that we are sure to uncover this evening in conversation with Miranda July. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Miranda July and Karen. <coughs> Hi, hello. Oh, hello. 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 Um, so first of all, um, thank you, Jordan, for those great opening remarks and the introductions. And um, I also want to thank our, our colleagues in innovation and creativity for their partnership in making tonight possible. But most of all, Miranda, I want to thank you for, um, for being here in, in conversation and for welcoming us into your studio. This is, this is really great. I'm yeah. so pleased to have you. It's sort of like our bookshelves, I, in my view anyway, <laughs> bookshelves are like a continuous, they like meet. That's pretty cool. There's a lot of reading material, yeah. There's probably some duplications, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, I'm so glad to be here, thank you. Here in my own home. <laughs> well, but that's what's so special about, you know, doing this virtually is that yeah. uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a little, a little show and tell. Yeah. Um, but so, so let's, let's dive right in. And, and I wanted to start out by talking about letters um, and really sort of the, the practice of letter writing that's something that's, that's really core to your work and that, that you've been doing from, from the very start, maybe even before you identified as an artist. And I wanna start here because you know, as we've been thinking about how, how do we tell the history of male art through the William S. Wilson collection of Ray Johnson, there are a lot of different places you could begin. Bill Wilson actually began his history. He began his binders in 1927, which is the year that Ray Johnson was born. Some other people would say, well, if you're gonna tell the history of the New York Correspondence School, you should start in 1963, which is the year that um, you first see the words New York Correspondence School on a document. But in our exhibition, we start in 1956, which is the time that um, Ray and Bill meet each other and exchange their first letters. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's sort of this, this story that, you know, um, Bill goes to, to Ray's house, he goes to his apartment, they kind of start doing a crit of, of some of his work. And the next day, he's sort of, he's talking to his friend, Norman Solomon, who had made the introduction. And, and he's sort of, um, I don't know, real, realizing that there might not be a way to stay in touch with this artist who was so interested, who was so interesting to him. And Norman says, you know, Bill, if, if, you, if you mail something to Ray Johnson, he'll probably mail something back to you. And that sort of promise of, of reciprocity and, and being in conversation and sort of um, having an exchange from afar, you know, several thousand stamps and envelopes later is what, what builds our, our, our archive. So I guess sort of with that backdrop, um, are there any particular letters you might like to, to share with us, Miranda? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, my archive, since I saved every letter or every piece <laughs> of mail I've ever gotten, um, it's funny, I was, I posted some of these on Instagram and people started writing yeah. me like, I sent you a letter you know, in 2004, do you still have that? And mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Like, I don't have to wonder, like I never found <laughs> one out. So um, yes, I have all of them. Uh, the first um, the first letter I have is, I can't see myself. Okay, yeah, is um, from my friend, oh. Monet Zolpo Dane. This is 1985 um, and, uh, I do think it's interesting, like children, now they have, you know, there's there's more ways they can stay in touch, but um, the postal service is so democratic and certainly at that time, um, it I think it was, 
it's all in a way it's almost already a um feels like a misuse of the postal service to be using it as a child, you know, like this thing that our parents use and that is like the core of their business life and their mm -hmm. livelihood and stuff. We can also use the same way as children um, and with the same stamps and, and, and there's not that many things. And there certainly weren't then like that, that were adult things that children could just as easily or safely do. And, um, I've been sort of pouring through all of those. Um, some of them, as I got older, uh, this is one um, sent. So I, I, of course, have the things that were sent to me. And I sent, mm -hmm. this was sent in a bottle from my friend, Johanna Fateman. Um, mm -hmm. I sent her letters um, <laughs> I remember sending a letter in a block of wax of paraffin um, and uh, which is tricky because the stamp, you know, has to be under the wax so it can't yeah. <laughs> really get stamped, which was always um, a challenge. I tried to send one on a butcher knife, but that didn't, Ooh. you can't send a knife <laughs> as a, as an envelope. Um, uh, and so I guess I will say while, while we are getting ready, I, I said, it suddenly occurred to me, while I've loved this object all these years, I, haven't, I hadn't opened it, um, you know, and of course there's a, a letter in here and I opened it just now and, and read it. And uh, it's basically our breakup. Oh, <laughs> she basically broke sad. up with me <laughs> with this hair, hair dye bottle. Um, I mean, you know, it was a long time coming, but just to say like, these things are, are cute and pretty and they're cool objects, but this is real life happening yeah. through here and, and really quite um, tender and intense and everything that you might transact through DMs or texts or whatever, like a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff, um, you know, was painful or, or, you know, full of love. Um, I have another nice object that I treasure that will be familiar to some people. So when I was at the, the Sundance lab, um, so this is jumping forward a bit in time, I'm like 29, uh, my friend Kayla Marisich sent me a FedEx envelope. And most of the people who got like important FedEx mail were the advisors. So those are like Hollywood screenwriters opening their FedExes from their agents and taking out scripts. And I opened this FedEx envelope and Kayla had sent, um, and I like unfolded this from the envelope. She had sent a, a temporary version of herself. Oh, that's fantastic. And in the pocket of her is a letter. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I remember, you know, as everyone kind of turned and looked at this, this long, uh, purse, paper person, um, I felt like she really had my back, you know, like I, I maybe was um, not yet a powerful filmmaker, but I, I was the only one who had like a friend who would send something like that. And that kind of in a way said a lot about like what I was coming from and what I was still going to make. I made, I was workshopping me and you and everyone we know there. Um, and then should I, if I can bring it into the, the present day and say that at the, at the start of this pandemic, actually sort of day one for me, I began a correspondence that has kept going through the whole thing with, um, uh, a person, a telephone solicitor who, uh, who I, I took the call of and listened to their spiel and then asked if I could ask them questions. And we then kept in contact. I asked them to DM me. So I'm bringing, I'm bringing correspondence into what we do now age. because I, I think that's important. It isn't, you know, it keeps changing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we made a project, a, this this is a magazine that a German magazine that um, printed 
our um, work and I, I would kind of give her assignments and she would message them back to me. So this is like, I asked her to make a, a mask um, uh, and this is what she made. Um, and, and we're still, we're, you know, it's become a really intense relationship. Um, and I think, uh, and I kind of work with, like she'll send me something and I'll kind of uh, sometimes add on to it. Um, uh, I don't know if you were wanting to jump in and talk about well, no, I, I was gonna. I was just gonna ask you. You know, when it was so interesting when you said that you've you've saved all of your your letters, and I mean, I'm I'm interested. Um, how, how did you? What was it that that made you realize that these would be sort of things that you'd want to hold on to? That you would you would want to preserve this sort of paper trail and uh, sort of uh, self archiving? Right. I mean, I think it was two things. One my dad kept an archive um, and saved everything. Uh, and I think he did that out of, you know, an adult sense that maybe his papers were valuable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought that was just kind of what you did. Um, and so I did it too. And also out of a sense that these papers might be valuable. I mean, granted, I was a child, um, but you know, you can't <clears throat> underestimate the, um, the grandiosity um, <laughs> of, of a child. I just, I just was like, you know, this is history. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing now because I actually did um, kind of do the things I wanted to do that that's, I think almost unrelated, you know, it, it, uh, it just was my sense of myself. Like it's all interesting. I, I didn't think it was more interesting than anyone else. I just thought this is what we should all be doing, you know, saving this stuff. At, when I started going through all this uh, and posting it last night, I suddenly was like, maybe I have, maybe this is all part of a problem of of holding on to things too long, um, not 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 like a hoard, in a hoarder sense, but emotionally. Um, Bill, Bill might... Wilson would not think that was a problem at all. He would he would be very much holding on to everything. <laughs> right, right yeah, I know. I'm I'm fine with the stuff, and I do think I, I think archives are powerful, and and different kinds of people should should um should keep them. Uh, all different kinds of people. So I encourage you know everyone to, uh, especially if you don't think anyone like you has kept an archive. Mm -hmm. um, it's more just, I don't want emotional stasis. So, yeah. okay, I'll just put that out there. Uh, well, okay, well, with, with that, I mean, maybe um, Devin, our, my, my colleague, uh, Devin Davis is behind the scenes and will be bringing up images. But when I saw uh, some of the letters that you were posting um, on Instagram, I, I made just a few selections of other letters that I thought might be interesting just just to see and Devin could we maybe bring up um let's let's just go to slide two actually we can I'm not seeing slide two. Oh, there we go so this is just this is kind of you know starting from previously the the most basic example of male art and um Actually, Devin, even if we go, let's go back to one. I just had one thing that I wanted to point out about that, which is just, you, you can see here just what a fledgling um, friendship this was between Bill and Ray, because Ray has, has actually misaddressed them. He's written to a Bill Miller rather than a Bill Wilson, but they still made it to the intended recipient um, and he, they've been treasured. Um, but let's move to the next um, one. And this is kind of, you know, when you're looking through Bill's binders, there can be some extremely complex multi-authored letters. And this is one that we, we like a lot. And when you sort of open it up and we can go to the next slide, um, you can see that, you know, there are things, um, there are letters, I can see that, that pink sheet of paper, that handwriting there from the artist, Carl Wortham. Um, you can see Bill's name um, on the envelope. You can also see that Dick Higgins was involved and there are some of the 
instructions and kind of assignment making that we'll we'll get into a little bit later as a please send to to Toby Spiselman. Um, the next slide, I think, we've got just sort of a, a fun use of uh, playful letterhead. Let's say you know taking something you might see at the grocery store and using that as the support of a of a letter. Um, but the the next one is actually really tender, and I was thinking of that both you know with your your story, Miranda, about sending something through the mail that's really difficult. We we do have we don't have any knives. I, I don't think we we definitely have some razor blades, but no knives. <laughs> um, but um, you know, this is just such a tender, heartfelt thing. You know, real life happening through through the mail, and and you can read here, Bill. This is a hem of a blanket which covers me every night as I sleep and dream. And there are all of these sort of wonderfully kind of um, tender sort of material artifacts um, that that we have as well. And let's go two more forward, Devin and. Uh, yeah, I just include these and, and we could maybe talk about these later on. But um, you know, you, when you're saying like children can use the postal service as a means of distribution, Ray also loves sort of playing up the really sort of official bureaucratic um, side of things. And, and he had a lot of fun with um, this particular stationery from the, the desk of Edward T. Crinian from the Department of Housing and Buildings. And he would use this um, as, a, as a support to write letters to himself. He would compose plays on it. He would um, make a list of famous people and what they have to say about his new $30 black leather motorcycle jacket. Um, but it, there's, a, there's a sort of fun um, role playing, let's say in some way, or taking on a different person's voice, um, even in, in mail as well. And I guess, this could be sort of our, our segue um, to like thinking about how mail art um, or the, the ethos of mail art, you know, becomes evident in a whole host of other practices. Um, so maybe one more, Devin. And this is, this is basically the first um, collage or, or the first modicos that, um, that, that Bill received from Ray. And you can see it's sort of bringing together a lot of different practices all in one. Um, if we move to the next slide, you can see that it's, it is a, a letter, you know, begins Bill, you know, thanks for your letter. Um, and it's also incorporating in, in the text and image, some of the commercial design work that Ray Johnson was doing. Um, so you can see there's an image of um, Artur Rimbaud, the poet, um, and if you happen to have this book on your shelves, um, actually, let's go back one, Devin. Um, you can see, you know, the the name R. Johnson um, just on the top. But but basically, you know, this is sort of where you start to see Ray Johnson's letter writing practice becoming something much much more, becoming really um, cross disciplinary. And so you you have the sort of proto pop um, Elvis collages that were were just up on the screen for a moment. But Ray then writes a, a manifesto, let's say, um, and he calls it, what is a modicos? And he, he starts thinking about, and we can move to the next slide, Devin. Um, he starts thinking about something that's gonna be social and, and mobile. Um, and you know, motion had been something that he had been planning in, in some of his compositions, like the next slide that we have. You can see sort of these centrifugal forms, um, but he then starts thinking about, you know, how do we, how, how am I going to make this art that is really part of, of everyday life? And I think I'll just um, show one more slide and then hand it over to you, Miranda, to just sort of uh, one more slide, Devin, if we could. Yeah, so this, he, he has this idea that, that some of his collages, some of his modicos could be, um, could be performance props. And this is his friend, um, the art historian, Susie Gablick here, who is surrounded by Modicos. And, and you start to see this, um, this sort of a, a studio practice that is suddenly very much out in, in the world and, and you're interacting with it. Um, and I guess I wanna sort of maybe ask you, Miranda, if you could talk about the ways that the idea of letter writing or the idea of correspondence has has um, 
has become much more multidisciplinary in, in your work. And if there are other sort of projects that you think sort of have the spirit of male art um, without sort of being letter writing as such. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I guess my, there's sort of two examples. One in high school, I, um, I, my sort of most formal pen pal was a many year long relationship with a man in prison named Franco Jones. Um, and, uh, these are some of, some of the letters from between us. There's more, and a lot of them were, were cassette tapes too, which had to be clear to be able to, um, go through prison. Um, and it's, it's a pretty intense relationship. I mean, I was 15 when it started and he was 38 and a murderer, you know, and, uh, in prison for life. And it, uh, it's, it's banned until I went to college. Um, and, uh, at a certain point, it sort of became almost like too much for the space of just the letters, which of course no one knew, you know, that's just two people and it's, it's a completely closed world. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wrote a play uh, and I put it on in, uh, it was called The Lifers. Yeah. Um, I think you have slides. Um, I put it on in, in this punk club in Berkeley uh, mm -hmm. called 924 six Gilman. We just called it Gilman. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't, I didn't act in the play. This was sort of before I thought of myself as a performer. I just, it was purely functional. Like I had to get it out. So I, wrote it down and it's very, it draws on our letters and I had other people, uh, an adult playing him. Um, and I, uh, it was my first real sort of like professional work. Um, I purposely didn't want it to be part of school. Uh, and it kind of was the start of like, oh, this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. So it's interesting that the thing that became so emotionally overwhelming that I, I had to make art years later, like Miss Moviola, which was, um, I don't know if you want to show any of these slides. Sure, but, let's um, do that. It uh, would be slide 26, Devin, if you've got that. Um, but actually, can I ask a question? Before we go into Big Miss Moviola, I, I yeah. wanted to sort of ask about lifers and, and your correspondence with, with Franco. And one often sees Franco's letters as the cassettes, you know, and, and why, why was that? Was he also writing on paper yeah. to you or was, was, was right, so right. I the mean, no. there's many letters that look like this, you know, um, there's a lot more letters than there are cassettes, but we actually, the cassettes are represented in the book because there was some legal concern about, uh, about yeah. the letters, um, reprinting them and, and, uh, at the last minute, actually, uh, they were, it was like, we can't, the lawyer said, we can't do those. And I was like, well, what about these cassettes? They're, they're just, there's nothing, you can't tell anything from them. So, but the cassettes were important for me. I mean, he thought it up because he could just talk. Um, we could kind of, it was much more immersive, you know, and he mm -hmm. would, sometimes we'd put songs on them. And so it'd be like talking and then a song and then talking a song. And those songs to this day are really, you know, come one of them comes on the radio and it's like very intense for me. Um, uh, what, what were the sorts of songs well, that you played? Or? One of them, um, and now I will sing, uh, which uh -huh. never a good idea. Um, yeah, it's that song, baby, now that, I found you, I can't let you go, baby, mm -hmm. even though you don't need me. Um, <laughs> see if you can figure out what song that is. That's a song, yeah. um, just not the melody. <laughs> um, uh, but these were things, you know, like it was a 
it wasn't a romantic relationship. Um, thank God. Uh, but it was really like, I was the only one writing him, you know, and mm -hmm. so it was very intense. And I think those, those words spoke to it. I used that song in the play and, um, and, you know, I got quite into uh, like cassettes were already a, a part of my life and I got quite into recording that those were kind of some of my first things I made were recording. So to me, it also kind of fits that I just, that was a, a good place for me as well. Like talking, gosh, wow. I, I never occurred to me like those tapes of my 15 year old voice, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, probably long gone. Yeah. And, and so making the, you, you were about to say sort of, you know, working on um, your, your correspondence with Franco becomes the, the play, Lifers, that you, you put on at, um, at the Gilman Theater. And then um, there was sort of, you, you were sort of transitioning to the idea of, of Big Miss Moviola, which also sort of has resonances with male art in that, and actually is really kind of quite, similar to this idea of, you know, you, you send something to Ray Johnson, he'll something, send something back to you. If people wrote to you, Miranda, um, what would they receive in, in return? Right, so um, yeah, as it says on there, send me your movie, lady, to any girls <laughs> or women, um, and $5 and I'll send you back. The latest Big Miss Movie All compilation tape, that's 10 lady made movies, including your own. So I called them chain letter tapes. Um, and they were just compilations of 10 movies each as, you know, imagine there's no other way to see each other's work. There's no YouTube, there's no Instagram, TikTok. Like, so uh, this was a, a way to feel like, maybe I wasn't the only young woman making movies on, um, you know, on a video camera. And I, and keep in mind at this point, I dropped out of college. There was no institution behind me, you know, or parents really, um, or like I, I was really um, free floating. I was a stripper. I, there, I, um, and so, the, the real idea behind this, and I think probably relates to Ray and a lot of artists, was sort of creating an institution um, that didn't really exist, right? Like it was just me, um, uh, but kind of it gave me um, uh, like I was the head of it, I was the center of it, I was the boss, like it gave me so much more power than I had in the world or than anyone was gonna give me, you know, this punk, um, very young stripper uh, artist. And, um, and it did its function well, like no institution could have done what Big Miss Moviola, Joni for Jackie did for me over 10 years, you know, like over 10 years, I became a filmmaker who made a feature film, you know, um, who, me and you and everyone we know. So like, it was a completely effective institution, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it, um, yeah, it, 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 it operated on like a, a totally different premise and it, it only valued um, not talent, but like, the impetus to make something, you know, as you know, I often would say, like, I don't, I don't decide which ones of these are good because usually that's done by by picking the ones that show promise in terms of like, you know, maybe you could be a Hollywood filmmaker or get into Sundance or something. But I, my idea was, I don't know why you made this. You might have made it to save your life on that particular day or to express something to a friend. Um, and as such, I can't judge whether it was successful at that. Um, and, and in that I was trying to say, 
there are so many different reasons for making movies and sort of take it out of the commercial or even sort of academic or all the, the worlds that, that people thought of it in and make it into this um, feminine, uh, spontaneous into essentially more what it is now, like something that you might do without any credentials um, mm -hmm. uh, in a very fluid way. Uh, I did that very laboriously through the postal system and VHS tapes. And so I guess maybe I, I want to ask about like the very sort of material side of it. How did you create the tapes? What, what was the production team like for, for Big Miss Moviola and Joni for Jackie? <laughs> well, it was, it was just me initially. And honestly, the first tapes were like, um, I think actually I was working at Goodwill before I got fired um, uh, for stealing. Um, but I would get tapes from there and I would copy over them to make, you know, I had two VCRs. So I would, so they're real, um, the very first ones are really clunky because I'm just, you know, each one is sort of crashing into each other. But I always made sure to have an introduction an intro and an outro, you know, um, which were kind of my opportunity to like do a little art because the very first ones I didn't, I hadn't yet made a movie, not even a short movie. So I didn't have any way to participate in it myself, not not for a little while. And then then kind of through doing this, I realized like, oh, I can make a movie. I, a few of them have my first short movies on them. And then I, I mean, I was really determined um, and I went to a, I looked up tape dubbing places and I went in and I met with this guy, John Chapman, bless his heart, couldn't be straighter person in the world, suit and tie, worked for this tape dubbing company. And I just like would go in and sit down and each tape I'd come in and ask, you know, could they essentially donate, you know, a run of like a hundred tapes. And we did that for years. Um, it was such an odd relationship. Like initially I, I had no way to conceive of it except as like a hustler kind of like, <laughs> you know, like at any second I expected like a blow job to happen or something like I, I couldn't, but, but that never happened. And, and Ultimately, they had to stop doing it because they decided some of the work was pornographic, you know? Um, uh, but it's amazing what, like who will end up collaborating. It was a good lesson in realizing like, you don't know who your allies are, you know? Like, like that guy supported, you know, made it happen, a big mystery for probably like eight years or something. Um, and allowed me to make much more professional tapes and um, more of them. And, you know, that was labor I didn't have to do. So, yeah, just have it's, to it's the, This um, process of sort of collaborating and, and hustling and getting people to participate in your, um, your mail art project is reminding me a little bit of um, a project that, that Ray did called um, A Book About Death. Um, so Devin, maybe we could go to um, slide 19 and uh, just maybe look at that um, work together. I don't know if that's coming up on screens, but um, yeah, so this was, uh, you know, it, interactive, um, you know, insofar as you can see on some of these, uh, you know, send, send a buck and, and get eight pages of uh, a book about death. And you can see, uh, you know, different drawings on here by, by different folks. Um, and, you know, the, the idea with this was it, it was a book, but it was an unbound book. And um, Ray would get sponsorship for, for each page. And, you know, you would, um, you would always have uh, eight pages sent to you, but no one would ever be able to create the book as a whole because, um, there were certain pages missing. There was no page 13 and, and there was no uh, page, page 14. But um, this, this might also sort of allow us to branch out into you know, some of the other aspects of Ray Johnson's work that we'll be presenting in, in the exhibition. And so 
kind of going from a, 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 an unbound book that's circulated through the mail, uh, you see the, um, in the, on page 15, this, this knife here, uh, Papa R. Snake. Um, that's a, a reference to the paper snake, um, which he was working on at the same time. And Devin, and we could maybe just go to the next slide there. You'll see um, Ray Johnson um, and, and the cover of, of the paper snake, which was the project that he did. He collaborated with um, Dick Higgins on this. It's actually Dick Higgins um, publishing um, an, an artist book that was all of the mail art that he had received from, from Ray. Um, and that little sticky note there, that little uh, kind of fluorescent arrow is pointing out the, the paper snake um, behind Ray um, in the bookshop there. Um, so let's, let's move uh, Devin to our next slide. And you can see in, inside some of the deluxe editions of the paper snake, there were actual works of, of mail art um, like like this one, where where Ray says, you know, Allison, uh, Allison uh, Knowles, uh, no opening, no closing, nothing, um, and um, and he puts this on a postcard for the Rubin Gallery. Um, and let's move forward again, uh, Devin. So the the Rubin Gallery there is it's a, it's a fictional institution. Um, it's it, it becomes the the Robin Gallery, and um, Ray would. Um, advertise exhibitions for the Robin Gallery. They're always these eight man shows, um, but it, it was a gallery that, that only existed through publicity and these sort of postcards. That was a kind of a, a, very, um, a very Ray Johnson uh, gesture and um, we'll be presenting this in the exhibition. Um, and one, one more slide, Devin, please. Um, and this is kind of bringing us back to this idea of, of performativity and you know, the idea of uh, no, um, no opening, no closing, nothing sort of brings us back to the, the performances that, that Ray would do. And this is a, a photograph actually that Bill Wilson took of um, Ray Johnson's second nothing. Um, really some of the only documentation that, that we have of this. Um, but I, I wanted actually to, to to shift now a little bit to some more, um, more recent technology. Um, and let's go um, now, Devin, if, if we could, to um, how about slide 28? You know, so even very, very early on, you can see that you know, things that are traveling by envelope um, are using telegrams. So we've got to get Western Union telegram um, on on the, the top there. And in our next slide, a little bit later, you know, we'll have um, a, a mailgram, Ray Johnson writing to uh, Lynn hirschman Leeson. And I guess that might bring us to a project, a collaboration like um, something like Learning to Love You More potentially. And if you could speak a little bit, Miranda, about the ways that um, you, you use the web to, um, to kind of create some of the communities and, and projects and um, uh, to basically sort of use it, using that as sort of a, a vehicle, maybe as a, a digital um, progression from something like Big Miss Moviola. Right, I mean, I, I'm so tempted, I don't know, I'm, it's like I'm thinking it's only hitting me through doing this conversation, Hum how much the mail thing has, has been a theme. So um, I did do a project called Learning to Love You More for seven years with Harold Fletcher that um, was kind of like the next step after Big Miss Moviola. Um, and it, it wasn't just film, it was about giving specific assignments to the public, to right. anyone, right. and you would complete the assignment and, um, and then just send the, the results. And it, it was kind of one of the very first uh, like web art things that, that wasn't about like displaying art on the web. It was about using the technology of uploading. And I can't quite explain how um, this seemed funny at the time because 
you the internet was used for um you know like professional things and the the idea that you might upload art um was 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 funny that was sort of a misuse of the technology it wasn't mm -hmm. um something people were used to doing and in fact uh a lot of the very first things that went up on this people couldn't figure out how to upload and they just mailed us. Um, I don't usually say that because it sort of messes up the mythology of it, but in this context, I guess that's okay. Yeah, they just would give up, you know, um, especially because we, there was some assignments were sound-based, some were videos. So, you know, even now uploading those things can be tricky and you can only imagine in 2002. Um, uh, but, um, more than 10,000 people participated in this, this project and we did, I think, 70 assignments. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, it, that is one project. Um, a, a really simple sort of mail art type project, a little like um, the, the uh, whatever the one with the snake was. <laughs> um, uh, is this project We Think Alone. Um, yes, yeah. And that that was a mail art project. It was just, it was just email art. And um, and I was actually specifically commissioned by this by this museum in Stockholm to make a piece in email. Um, and I think they thought I would make the art, but at the time I was I was writing a novel and I that it seemed like anything where I didn't have to have authorship was like maybe a easier, although this ended up being quite hard. So I thought, well, why create an email? Every, there's, it, it's like an unlimited um, uh, resource. Everyone has so many emails in their, their sent email folder. And I, to this day, I'm still always um, trying to get people to send me, I'll, I'll say like, send me an email that, that is sent to your, that you wrote to your mom or send me an email, like a work email. I don't know how you are at work. Like, I, I love that. I, I'm still utterly <laughs> unsatisfied, even though I did this whole project. Um, uh, so there were 20 emails over 20 weeks and each week had a theme. And so these people on there, including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, just like a fairly random list of, mm -hmm. of um, people who are in the top of their field. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, they would, so one week it would be, each one would give me a email that included an apology or an email that had a picture of art in it, had some kind of art in it or um, an email uh, about money. That was an interesting one, you know. Um, uh, and the funny thing was, while this was supposed to be really simple, um, the when any, anything that has to do with celebrities and email ends up being like a legal nightmare, like each mm -hmm. person had to have their own um, contract made by a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and re this was right at the same time, the whole NSA, like email and email security was <clears throat> really hot topic. And this somehow uh, collided with that moment. Um, so uh, anyways, and I, I loved the, just the way they looked, the, the format, mm -hmm. I kept, there was a lot of thought about how to maintain the integrity of each work. And then also um, the ephem ephemeralness of it. it um, mm -hmm. You subscribed, you know, and there were more than 100,000 subscribers to this and you got it each week and then that was it. There was no compendium. There was no way to get it. If you saved yours, then you had it. You essentially had a book, but the book didn't exist. And so I remember for years after that, actually, I'd see people writing, asking each other, do you have all the emails from that? You know, like it, it became this sort of like artwork that there were a hundred thousand owners of, but you know, not necessarily everyone treasured it because it could also just be worthless, you know? Um, well, and I wanted to ask that both with, um, with, with We Think Alone and with Learning to Love You More, could you talk a little bit about like what, what makes a really good assignment and sort of how you would um, shape those projects for participants? Yeah, I mean, 
I learned so much about directing from doing Learning to Love You More because you would, you would make an assignment. So for example, could be something really simple, like take a picture of the sun. Um, that one was fairly foolproof, but people always found a way to fuck it up, you know? <laughs> and we were really stringent. Like we had an idea, you know, it was our art. This whole project was our, you know, work. So we would start to get assignments in, um, or reports as we called them. And we would keep tweaking the instructions again and again and again until they all started coming back the way that we wanted them. And um, so many things, apps, performances, so many interactive works that I made after that kind of built on that same idea of how do you create a whole big enough for anyone and for, you know, for fluidity, but clear enough um, that actually you can make art with it, um, like you meaning me. Um, and so, yeah, cause some of them were kind of nuanced like act out a recent argument, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I love the results from that assignment but that took, you know, weeks and weeks of tweaking to actually get, um, you know, the, the responses that are on there. Or, or like, you know, photograph a significant outfit something like that. I think right, that's right. great. And that we wanted them all to be shot from above, laid out on the floor, you know. Um, and then, you know, then I had to add like stand on a chair or a table, you know, like because they didn't all look, you know, exactly right. Um, so we were both, you know, we were super controlling for people who were trying to collaborate on a public art project with, you know, an unlimited number of people. So I'm, I'm seeing right now some, some comments coming in that um, we should probably shift to, to Q&A. Um, does that uh, work for you, Miranda? If we, yeah, yeah. If we open, bring Jordan back and uh, start taking some questions from our audience? Yeah. Great. I, I think I'm here. I hope everyone can see me. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Miranda, for that amazing conversation. There were so many great connections between your practice, Miranda, and Ray's practice and we have some really great questions coming in from the audience and maybe I'll start with this one and it relates a little bit to the archive and how it's sort of and your approach to it and the question is are there any guiding principles for how you organize letters and materials from across the years and would you have any advice for someone starting a mail art practice of their own? Oh um no, I mean, you kind of couldn't do too much worse than me um, beyond saving everything. Well, I mean, maybe because I'm here, this is going to be embarrassing because it's sort of a mess. But um, like right now, there's, um, you can see there's like boxes, um, you know, you can see this says like mail 25, I don't know, they're just in bankers boxes. Um, and then um, like in this room, here's a whole wall of boxes um, and boxes in general. Um, so in terms of mail, I just date a box and then I fill it and then I, when it's full, I put the lid on. It's kind of like the Andy Warhol approach um, to archiving, which actually was an influence. Like I saw those archives when I was pretty young um, in my twenties and I thought, well, that's an easy way. And I, I have, besides the mail archive, I just, there's the mail and then there's just the archive archive, which is just anything. Um, uh, but I will say there's there's one archive that the Joni for Jackie archive I at a certain point I I couldn't run that project anymore Big Miss Moviola Joni for Jackie and so I had to get organized enough to box it all up send it to Bard College they ran it for a little while then they kind of forgot about it and eventually it went to the Getty um, Research Institute to to a, a really kind of wonderful archive. And so um, it all was boxed up and sent there. And then everything I had here, which was um, about, you know, I don't know, 50 boxes um, got, got taken there. And that, I don't know, that was kind of a lesson in like, um, 
I remember the day, whatever, I won't go on about that. Um, anyways, no, just save stuff and organize it however you, however you want. <laughs> it's so funny that to see all these boxes because, you know, while Bill Wilson sort of had a uh, proclivity for binders, Ray loved boxes, similar to okay. Warhol. And there's actually, in the exhibition, there'll be a selection of boxes called the Bob Boxes in which he sort of put all types of miscellaneous um, items and mixed media objects and sort of designated it to this man named Robert Warner. And it's sort of a particular way of him sort of packaging and parceling his practice as sort of a suit oh, nice. in a box, if you will. But to go into another question from the audience, um, have you ever returned any of your letters back to their senders? During the pandemic, I had time to track down and send some childhood letters back to their writers. It was hard to part with them, but a really great way to reconnect and share memories. I mean, I would never do that, but I would ask for my letters back. Um, <laughs> uh, and I would like, you know, send some photos maybe. Um, uh, but that's nice. That that woman sounds like she's on a, or person on a different path. Perhaps one, she's probably living in the moment more. And that's good. Okay, I mean, here's another question that's a little bit about emotion and how do you send emotion through the mail. Um, lately, I'm thinking a lot about love being sent in the mail. My question is, how do you know what to, what and how to keep? Because as more objects accumulate, um, it seems like there's also things that must be let go. I would love to know some of your thoughts and what your system and reasoning and process is. So I guess you answered some of this in terms of basically keeping everything, but I guess, is, is there any sort of way that you sort of um, designate something that is particularly emotionally effective or something? Well, I do have some discrete folder, like there is a, a, a folder that's, I mean, it's several folders from my husband. There's one from Juan, um, Juan is, uh, kind of quasi homeless handyman who I've had a um, like 17 year relationship with and he sometimes leaves letters and notes. So I keep all those and I, there are some sort of discrete chapters, I guess. Um, yeah, it's not total mayhem. So there's a question about sort of the switch from the analog to the digital. Um, how does the act and the meaning of archiving change when the medium switches from paper, which is relatively tangible, to something uh, more digital or diffuse? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, to me, it's like, it becomes, you know, while, while these boxes are kind of overwhelming to me, they are finite. Um, Whereas the second it's in the digital world, like I know that's finite too, in terms of like what I actually have and all these hard drives and stuff, but don't you just kind of, it just seems like, just like the, the universe, the solar system or something like the second you're into the digital world and then all the sort of um, ways that you've engaged with the internet, you know? Um, like, do you include that? Uh, I think that is, in a way, the lack of architecture, the idea that there is no, um, no real system, like the messiness of the internet, the whole point is like, it's this web and it goes on forever and stuff. That is, uh, I think, um, upsetting. I think it, it, it upsets us. And so things like Instagram, you know, these, these feeds, you know, you have your, um, your scroll, it may be endless, but it's linear, you know? Um, and there, there's all these ways that we try and contain it um, uh, to make it like the physical world. Um, but of course, all its problems have to do with not being like that. Like we're, we're really so far behind, we're really trying, treating it like it's safe or something, yeah. I guess on the note of sort of the digital and sort of technological modes of connecting, um, there's a question about the Somebody app and if you could talk a little bit about the birth, life and death of it. Oh, um, right. So somebody was, um, a, a, had a relationship to learning to love you more. It was um, an app. And if you sent a message to someone through the app, then your message would be delivered um, 
not it wouldn't go to the per, your friend it would who you sent it to it would go to the somebody near user nearest your friend and then that person would deliver the message as your surrogate so they would perform it and so what you were sending was actually a script um to be performed and uh and you could also just deliver messages this it was funny we were just in santa barbara last weekend and um i i said um to mike I, I miss somebody do you remember when we were here and i opened the app and we were in santa barbara and i was like are there any floating messages and there was there were messages and i delivered one and it's it was so fun to be able to be somewhere where you didn't live and yet engage with a person um in a way that was meaningful to them because it was from their friend but it came from a stranger uh um that's that was very, one of the few things I made that I got to participate in the same way anyone else would. Um, so I think sometimes I miss it for that reason. It, it doesn't stress me out like like a one woman show might or something. It's like, uh, I, I wish I could do that now. I was just going to say that, Miranda, there's a there's a nice sort of parallel to a uh, uh, Ray Johnson delivery, the, the person that Jordan was mentioning, Bob Warner, the recipient of the BOD boxes, um, was once one uh, sort of was, was tasked with delivering um, a kiss to, to Bill Wilson when he was in the hospital. Yeah. So there are just sort of nice little uh, deliveries like that too. Yeah. And yeah. I sort of had a question in relationship to this, like this idea of assignments and scripting sort of activities through the mail. And I'm just, Curious um, if you see any relationship, Miranda, between you know sort of these mail assignments um, and sort of directing an actor exchange via the mail and, and sort of scripting activities and sort of a screenplay or performance. You know, do you see there these as potentially parallel or anything? Yeah, I mean, especially when I'm, you know, I've made a lot of things with non-actors, whether those are people in the audience or within movies. Um, uh, you know. There was someone in my second movie, The Future, who I met through the Penny Saver, um, which incidentally comes with your mail um, uh, or used to. Um, it's like a classified thing. Anyways, uh, yeah, to me, it's all the same thing. It's it's essentially throwing down like a dare, you know, and then m helping someone feel like incredible enough to do the dare. Um, and then like uh, do something with, with it. Um, like that is, is, that is like one area of practice, you know, and it, it happens in all different ways. And I like that it could happen just in a moment with a friend, you know, I think that's how it first started and how a lot of our art first starts, you know, with like, um, kind of just like a thing you're, you and your friends think of doing and like your heartbeat speeds up and then you're like, oh my God, we're really gonna do this, you know? And uh, and then just like the scale changes. But I also like to, to make it small again. Um, like I don't, I don't, to me, it was never about like get bigger and bigger and bigger until you've, you know, it, it, it was like, well, isn't it cool that you could um, then go back and make something incredibly intimate um, that could only be done in that way and and not and even money can't you know make it happen more. Intimacy is a great seg to what I think has to be our last question from the audience um, and because you've shared so many amazing intimate letters and objects and stories with us this evening and there's a question that is the, int the intimacy of male art is on my mind. And can you speak to the process of making these intimate objects public? What is this like for you? Yeah, it, that's something I thought about also looking at, at the Ray Johnson book that we're very alone, you know, like ultimately when you're making these things, you're alone, but you're thinking so hard about someone else, but you don't have to deal with them or the full complex reality of them because they're not there. You can just love them um, and perform for them and kind of declare yourself, you know, to them. And uh, and there's something 
both kind of wild about that. Like, like there's no rules, you're free to do that and what can you get away with and incredibly safe, right? Like you, it, it's, its limits are very clear and um, you never actually have to face um, uh, the, the mess, you know, of, of two people being in the same place at the same time. And, and in a way that's beautiful. Like I think there are some intimacies that are more possible and, and um, that in a way don't work face to face um, and that's okay, you know. Um, and of course we found that, you know, in all different uh, technologies now, and and that's not always we're not always worse for it. I don't think. Well, thank you so much, Miranda. It's been great to be face to face with you <laughs> this evening. <laughs> so we're apart. Um, and Caitlin, I don't know if you want to close the program out for us or. Well, I just wanted to thank you as well, Miranda. This was amazing to, to hear from you and think about your work in resonance with Ray Johnson. And I hope that we can welcome you to Chicago in November uh, for the exhibition. Yeah, that'd be nice. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, I, it, this was a total pleasure. All right, amazing. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Good night.